Good day, everybody, coming at you today talking about the powers of Congress uh, and particularly uh, looking at the very specific powers of Congress that are listed in Article 1, Section 8. And the question we need to look at, does Article 1, Section 8 really limit the power of government? See, the founders actually wanted to only give it a certain amount of power uh, so that the government wouldn't be out of control. Uh, and unlimited. Uh, and so we need to kind of look at this a little bit more specifically. Does it really limit the power of the national government? So let's get started. Okay, so uh, Article 1, Section 8 specifies the powers of Congress in really great detail. These powers are limited to those that are listed and those that are necessary and proper to carry them out. All of the other lawmaking powers are left to the states. So if it isn't listed here, it's left to the states very specifically. The first Congress was concerned that the limited nature of the federal government wasn't actually clear enough in the original Constitution. And they later adopted Amendment 10, which said, all right, if we didn't list it here, those powers and those actions are reserved to the states or to the people. And all of those not specifically granted to the federal government are held on to by the states. So if you take a look, they can do anything from, you know, establish and collect taxes to borrow money all the way on down to establish post offices and grant, patent, grant patents and copyrights. There's peacetime powers and, of course, there's wartime powers. There's things that they need to do in order to conduct war and defend our country. And there's other things they need to do in order to maintain the well-regulated and function of our country. So we're going to dive into a little bit of the specifics here. Uh, and you're going to need to kind of remember the importance of these basic, broadly defined powers of Congress. That's an activity I'm asking you to do. These powers of Congress and uh, the interpretation of the powers of Congress really emerge out of a case called Gibbons versus Ogden. Uh, and in this case, you have two ferry operators. Uh, and in one uh, situation, uh, the state of New York had given this ferry operator exclusive right uh, to operate these steamships on New York waters. Uh, and New York and New Jersey are sharing these waters at the same time. Uh, and so you have another ferry operator who said, no, New York is not allowed to give exclusive right to operate. This is an interstate issue, uh, and the United States government um, is stepping in here. Uh, the other ferry operator said, no, you know, New York gave the United States the ability to regulate interstate commerce, and I have a permit from the national government. Uh, the way the court rules is basically saying, well, yeah, because it says the Congress has the right to regulate interstate commerce, that allows the national government to step in uh, because it's commerce going between the states. The Commerce Clause gives Congress this broad power to regulate a lot of aspects of our economy and to pass things like environmental or consumer protections because so much of the business that we do today, either in manufacturing or distribution, actually crosses state lines. But the Commerce Clause powers are not unlimited. So it's not something that we can pass any piece of legislation and call it part of the Interstate Commerce Clause. It's not as limited, it's not as unlimited as you might think. Now, even before the court interprets the Commerce Clause, the court in 1819 in a case called McCulloch versus Maryland interprets what we call the Necessary and Proper Clause. And here, the big bad national government is creating a uh, a national bank. And the state of Maryland is saying, wait a second, you don't have the right to do that. It doesn't say so in Article 1, Section 8 anywhere. And we don't want you to tax, and we don't want you to have a bank that could actually run, you know, run us into the ground. So Maryland taxes the bank of the United States. And you have a situation here where a state is trying to be supreme and have power over the national government. Uh, and the courts say, no, you can't do that. Number one, the national government is supreme law of the land. And number two, 
Congress can do whatever is necessary and proper. It says so in Clause 18 of Article 1, Section 8. And they said that a national bank was necessary and proper to carry out the Congress's power to tax, which is contained in our Sections 1 and 2 of Article 1, Section 8. And Maryland loses this case. And two pieces of merge out of McCulloch versus Maryland, the issue of supremacy and the issue of the necessary and proper clause. So, simple review, right? The Interstate Commerce Clause is something that gives the national government the authority uh, to regulate business activities. Pretty much anything can be declared interstate commerce, but the courts have set limits on the Interstate Commerce Clause. One that is pretty unlimited is the Necessary and Proper Clause. It's widely interpreted, and both of these things taken together really open up and expand the power of government. Now, in recent years, the U.S. Supreme Court's begun to express greater concern for states' rights. Those listed powers are only listed for the national government, but all unlisted powers are given to the states. Right? So the Supreme Court's actually given a series of rulings that limit the power of Congress to pass legislation under the Commerce Clause or any other powers in Article 1, Section 8. For example, these rulings have actually found unconstitutional the federal laws aimed at protecting battered women, uh, or protecting schools from gun violence on the grounds that these types of police matters are actually more properly managed by the states. So we have this tension, national government power versus states' rights. Sounds familiar? Think back to the beginning of the course. Okay, so now we actually get to kind of the title of what our topic was today. The powers of Congress that are listed in Article 1, Section 8 can really fall into one of three types of powers. They're either express powers, implied powers, or inherent powers. Now, all of the re these three things require some interpretation, some more than others. The express powers are those that are listed directly in Article 1, Section 8. It's clear as day what the power of Congress is. Now, the implied powers are those that are closely related to the express powers and through the Necessary and Proper Clause actually give authority to act to the government. Uh, the inherent powers are similar to the implied powers, but it says basically if Congress has this express power, then they might have to do some other things to actually create that power. So the inherent power, an example, would be if they have the power to raise an army and a navy, well, it's inherent within that power that they have to get members for this service, and so they might be able to institute the draft. That could be an example of the inherent power. But when we take a look at all three of these things, it does require some interpretation of the Constitution on our part, or on the court's part. Now, as we've spoken about in class, there's a large debate on the role of government in people's lives, even still today. And in many ways, this is no different than the debates that are founding of our country. However, when they wrote the Constitution, they attempted to isolate those key functions and the powers of the national government and outline them in Article 1, Section 8. Unfortunately, that didn't prevent the controversy and leaves us with some interpretation issues. So... I want you to go to the document called Constitutional Interpretation, and you'll see there it's got the full text of Article 1, Section 8. All the powers of Congress are listed there. And your task is to read through the examples on the second part of that sheet and identify where those powers fit or where they emerge from. Spend some time with a partner looking at the text and answer those questions, uh, and I'll go over them with the I'll go over the answers with you here in a minute. So. Find that document, pause this video, do the work, and I'll see you back here in a second. Hey, while you guys were away, I was looking at this. Uh, you might think I'm trying to grow something here, some sort of little chin beard, just a lower lip beard, but it's not. It's just that weird lighting. But I noticed that while you guys were working. So let's talk about each one of these things and the results that you found. If we look at the right to establish an interstate highway system or federal roads, it doesn't say anything in there 
about an interstate highway system. Heck, we didn't even have cars. We didn't even know what we could do. But what it does say is we have the ability to establish post roads. Now, the interstate highway system carries our mail. So if we look at clause number seven, post roads is where we get that from. Oh, and we use necessary and proper clause, clause 18, to fit that in. You could also make the argument that to establish an interstate highway system was necessary and proper as part of the military powers, right? If you've ever driven on the highway system, you've known or seen that it's called the Eisenhower Interstate Highway System. President Dwight Eisenhower, having seen what the German Audubon looked like, having seen what Europe needed to successfully fight and win World War II, said, hey, if we ever have a war on our soil, we got to have a highway system. And that's the birth of the interstate highway system. There's been a lot of business benefits from that. There's been a lot of government benefits from that. But they all work together. But it can emerge out of the necessary and proper clause, either through the military powers or the post-roads powers. So it gets to be a lot of interpretation. Now, if we look at establish and support an air force, all right, think about that. We didn't have cars, so we didn't enter into Article 1, Section 8, anything about highways. Well, we didn't even know we could fly, so how are we going to put an air force or the right to create an air force in there? Well, we found it somehow because we have an air force, and we have got to fit that in with the Constitution in some place. Well, we fit it in in Clause number 1, provide for the common defense, right? Clause 12 and 13, establish an army and a navy. And, of course, Clause 18. Yeah, that's the necessary and proper clause. I think you're getting the pattern. So, taking a look at set up time zones and the atomic clock for our country, that is a standard of weight and measure. And fixing the standards of weights and measures comes from Clause number 5. Raise the debt ceiling and borrow more money for government spending? Well, that emerges out of Clauses 1 and 2 to borrow money and pay the debts of our country to regulate monopolies emerges out of clause number three and this is a big one this is the interstate commerce clause and we go back to that idea of the national government regulating the business practices that affect people across the country to set and enforce immigration policy that's easy laws of naturalization come out of clause four Prevent a state from making their own money or printing their own money? Well, that comes out of Clause 5. The idea is standards of weights and measures, coin money, and regulate the value of the currency. That comes out of Clause number 5. To protect copyrights and patents, the useful arts, and protect those artists and those inventions that we're talking about comes out of Clause 8. To create the District of Columbia. See, we didn't know where the state, the nation's capital was going to be, but they knew it's going to have to be somewhere. So they put in clause number 17 that said Congress can create the national capital. And, interesting note, a little trivia here, cannot exceed 10 square miles. That's as big as Washington, D.C., or the nation's capital in our country could ever get. All right, now we get to some controversy. Create a national health care requirement for all workers. We might call this Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, the individual mandate, but the law in question is, can the national government require all people to have some sort of health insurance? And then maybe, if they're, they don't have that, pay a tax penalty. See, this was controversial. The Supreme Court said, yes, absolutely, the individual mandate can happen under the power to tax. But the Obama administration was saying, well, let's create a national health care requirement for all workers out of the Commerce Clause. So you could use interstate commerce or you could use the power to tax. The court uses the power to tax. And so that's Clause 1, if we look at that uh, as a, a true example. But the argument was it's also interstate commerce out of Clause 3. Now, Another big controversy that I mentioned before, to charter a national bank run by the government. We know that they can do that. We know McCulloch versus Maryland said they could. Well, where do they get that power? 
They get it out of clauses one and two. Power to tax means you got to collect the money somewhere. Power to spend means you got to write a check from somewhere. So where are you going to get both those things? In a bank. And so the national government, through the necessary and proper clause, is allowed to create a national bank run by the government. Now, what about banning discrimination in public restaurants, businesses, and schools? We know we can't do that. We know we can't stop serving somebody because of their religion. We can't stop serving somebody because of their race. We can't stop serving somebody because of their physical disability. Well, why? It emerges again out of the Commerce Clause. Business, public restaurants, schools are interstate commerce. And so, because they involve interstate commerce, the national government can regulate it. And we get things like the civil rights legislation. And these are really big, big controversies when they were passed. Maybe not so much now, but it all has to do with how do we interpret the Constitution. People that interpret it very strictly, very narrowly, don't like any of these things that we just went through. People that interpret it very loosely, well, yeah, you know, necessary and proper, sure, why not? Live in the now, man. Let it happen. That's where the controversy begins to kind of emerge. And that's where you start to see a lot of political division, especially when these things have to be decided by the Supreme Court. Okay, so now what? You guys worked hard. We went through that list. Hopefully that makes a little bit more sense now. But I want to see what you've been thinking about. And I want you to answer the following question that you see right here um, on Seesaw. Right. So both the Necessary and Proper and the Interstate Commerce Clauses have very much expanded the power of the national government. Now, was it wise for the uh, – sorry for the typo. Was it wise for the founders to write such language that relies too much on interpretation? Or, you know – is it really necessary? What's your interpretation of it? Does it go too far? I want to see your response on Seesaw. That's all for now. Ta-ta.